Uh, yeah. God, who else? Is Floyd alive? Is Bobby Mack alive? Uh, Floyd got killed in jail. I, Bobby Mack, he was also part of John Jett's crew, right? Really cool guy. I th he's still around, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I thought he's still Very suave. And told you, Jules, he's still alive. Yeah. Very <laughs> suave guy. So it's like so many people that I knew, but I forget the question. I know. It was all right. <laughs> it was the situation forced it in part, but it was also intended. So, and, and I wanted to play with this, <clears throat> like going to these, I had just seen Reds, I think, if you know that film, Rubber Red. Warren Beatty. Warren Beatty, yeah. Um, thanks guys, thank you. Uh, and they have these, they cut, it's kind of this Brechtian thing where they cut to, they do straight to the camera interviews and that's supposed to take you out of the experience of the film in this Brechtian way. And so I wanted to do that and I was interested in what would happen if you did that when the film purported to be real in the first place. So I was interested in those layers of fiction and reality. And Tigger, of course, was playing with the same questions in terms of her relationship with you, Mitch. Indeed. <laughs> so I guess the same question would be uh, for Mitch about how did it feel, I guess, on the on the set creating something that was documentary but not documentary, playing yourself but not playing yourself. Also, there's a line in the film that you can only sort of be yourself in porn if you're not yourself. So there's a lot of this it sort of... It was really reflective. difficult. Yeah. I mean, it was really difficult for me because the truth is, at that point, I hadn't really created a persona yet. I was just starting to create a persona to kind of save me from real life. And this came so close to it that it was a little dangerous for me, a little difficult. Um, because it had elements of my real relationship, my real addiction and my relationship with heroin and, and cocaine at the time and, um, and art. And um, it was hard because I kind of had no defense, so I had to come up, that's pretty much when I came up with Sharon Mitchell uh, during this. Uh, so I needed something to hide behind. I needed something to promote. I needed something to be proud of, all of that. It was very difficult. And who is Sharon Mitchell? Then or now? Then. Then? Yes. Your Good persona. Question. A young lady searching for herself, enjoying the um, throes of ecstasy both in flesh and in drugs and in art. She also seems and super punk rock. <laughs> Pardon? She also seems super punk rock. Oh, most definitely. Oh, fuck yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I can do that. Yes, of course. <laughs> so that's very interesting because I feel when, when people talk about porn or when civilians talk about porn, they're talking about the idea of exposure. But this is almost like another level of exposure because this is intimate, this is about drugs, this is about persona, this is about self, this is about close relationships. And is that something that you're interested in exploring and making this movie? Because it is because uh, porn is not considered very intimate, but this is incredibly intimate, especially because these are real people that you're putting in the movie. I was at the time I was thinking about luring luring straight men into the theater to voyeuristically watch this film and not and to then, kill them. And then and then and then instead of delivering, you know, the sex scene. Um, hitting them with this other level of truth. So it's like more intimate than they would have wanted. That was the drive for that, to sort of confront them with this level of intimacy that they would be horrified by. Can I say something that's not about Siri? So a lot of people in that movie also, there, there was a big cross-section between like uh, the New York music, junkie scene, very cool. And Jerry Abrams, who, I mean, we were just kidding around. I ended up interviewing him for my college newspaper. But people, they were in the porn industry, but it wasn't like this big divide of people. I mean, we all hung out together. Yeah. So that's, 
Well, I was going to say is that one of my friends, uh, you know, old school punk rock chicks and stuff like that, my friend Lydia Lunch talks about her sex work time that she did, and there was, of course, it's a very good note that there was no, no line. You just did what you could out in the world, in the art scene, making these sort of, uh, these films. So how did I mean, you... Jennifer, Jennifer knows, I mean, you know, we were all into the punk rock scene. We were all in punk rock groups and bands. Uh, we were backup singers. We were backup dancers. We were doing our own avant-garde fashion shows and doing all kinds of different stuff back then. And um, I think during that time, there was an intertwine between um, the sex community, at least the dancers and the the strippers and the the artists and the punk rockers. I mean, because we were just intertwined constantly. I mean, we're always doing backup singers, you know, for New York Dolls or the Reed or, or whatever we were doing or fashion shows. And another thing I'd like to point out that I always I always want to make clear about this time, there was no who's gay, who's straight, who's bi, who's this, who's that. I mean, it really was trisexual. I mean, everybody was fucking each other. There were really not that many labels yet around. And that was really refreshing. Yes. <laughs> so, Juliet, how did you wind up in the scene? Sort of, what is your history of arriving with this very colorful, awesome friend group? Ah, uh, I, uh, I... <laughs> I was, uh, I was a college student, and I got an internship with George Chichery, who you know. And uh, he, when that internship ended, and I had to face real life and get a job, the phone rang, it was George. He said, do you want a job on a feature film? And I said, oh my god, this is it. I'm living the dream. I'm getting a job in a movie. And uh, Harold Adler came to pick me up. And oh, god. Harold Adler, the mushroom. Yeah. And he had hair like a mushroom. Yeah. <laughs> he took me to this film set, and to my, honestly, to my horror, it was a porn movie. <laughs> and uh, they had a closed set, it was in that haven. And uh, I will never forget the moment that she came flying out from doing this anal sex scene. And uh, she was wearing her little pink tracksuit and her matching tennis shoes, and she just bounced out. She was all glowing, and my mouth just hit the, you know, my idea about porn at the time was, uh, uh, you know, Tijuana back rooms and, you know, donkeys and things like that. Uh, so, and there was just this fellini uh, situation. I wanted to make a movie about it right off the bat, and then I met Tigger. And that dovetailed perfectly with her fantasy of doing an homage to you. Uh, so we melded the two together, and this was the result. So the muse, the muse of Mitch. Yes. Are there any human beings out there that have questions for these awesome people on stage? There's quietness. Oh my god, back there. Back there. <laughs> I see a hand. What is your question, my friend? I was just tripping out on your hair. On uh, my hair? <laughs> yes, no, as authentic punk rockers, everyone on this stage, and even Mitch, we're all punk rockers here right at the moment. Yeah, CBGB style. No, that, the, uh... Hey, Amen. Hey, Mitch. Uh... Who are you, if you know, if you know Sharon? She might like to say hi to you, too. Yeah, I was just saw Sharon in San Francisco. Shelly Mars. Shelly oh, Mars. Oh, the Shelly Mars, my new Facebook friend. Yes, hi, Shelly Mars. How are you doing? Yes. One of the, uh, Alan from Cinekink was like, why don't you know Heather Buckley? Yeah. Now we all know each other. Yes, amazing uh, drag, drag king and uh, performance artist, which is very big uh, back in sort of like the 80s, uh, the, the 80s time performance and just being free and, experim and experimental. And star of the short on the DVD. Yes. Oh, yes. No, that was very, that short was... We were able to get that short from the AFI. We were proud of that. All right. And it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be on the disc. And just obsessed with Crash, but seeing like a queer version of Crash, or more queer, is super nice. super amazing. <laughs> nice. So um, so Mitch, uh, how are you um, how are you approached to uh, to be in uh, Kamikaze Hearts, knowing that this movie would be about you, the Muse, 
and your persona, but not necessarily the self. I actually wasn't. Oh, I actually wasn't. Pardon me for if I cut you off. I'm sorry. It's just because of the connection. I, it's also finished? New York City style. We can talk over each other. It's fine. I'm I, was living, okay. I was living in New York City on 13th Street, and um, and Tig and I were kind of going back and forth between San Francisco and New York and Los Angeles and um, everywhere in between. Um, I really didn't know the focus was me. I just thought it was about us. I really didn't know what I was walking into. I was just honoring her request. Well, when we started out, the idea was this idea that you guys wanted to do a film that sh showed like the ultimate love scene, the love scene that could never be shown by, could never be created by somebody like Jerry Abrams. So this was going to be the opportunity to do that. That was the idea. She didn't I, tell you that. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> so and then we're in scene after scene, we're in pursuit of this elusive animal, the ultimate love scene. That's what we're after there. And it yeah, keeps I, being aborted yeah. until we get yeah. to the final. This is my dick scene. I think everyone yeah. just had such big personalities that, you know, everyone was basically were on their own and, you know, kind of being entertaining. But I like, I know I love seeing myself young and beautiful and some of my clothing because I did some wardrobe sharing. God damn, man. You, you're incredible is i'm really aren't you glad there's a record of that yeah, yeah, it's like my granddaughter if i had one yes yeah. <laughs> it's just beyond that is something we send that yeah it's a capture of the fashion of the time i know i was super obsessed with like the 80s rouge when you just go down straight new wave style and i saw your amazing like authentic gear and it was so beautiful your uh your punk rock gear in the in, in the film how did you wind up with this crazy crew? Well, I don't know. I felt like uh, some of the people became my friends. Oh, actually, I was living with this guy, Peter Belsito, in sort of an alleyway called Woodward Alley near 14th Street and Stevenson. And I think they filmed that thing with um, Jerry Abrams there. Yeah. And I think it was like basically two hundred dollars. And an interesting fact, I think we can I think we can air now about the money. Tell me if we can't. I don't know what you mean. Oh, okay, so Hans Legler, um, I also went out with this guy Hans Fuss, but they were washing German Rajneesh hash oil money. What? Wow. Yes. That's rock and roll. <laughs> No, they were hairdressers. They were German hairdressers. The other eight. Rajneesh hash oil money? Uh-huh. Because I went out with Hans face. <laughs> well, you would know then. <laughs> oh, a human? Hello, human. How are you? What is the question that you have for these lovely people up here? Uh, the first part of the movie we shot in about five days, um, <clears throat> and then the cinematographer walked off. He said he couldn't participate in a film that was, you know, he thought he was a, he was a big lefty cinematographer. He agreed to do this film because he wanted to, you know, support women doing a film about exploitation, and then he found that. It didn't fit his idea about what a film about exploitation should be. He, he took me out. He gave me. He lectured me. He said, "No, you've got to. You've got to. We're going to go. We're going to ride around town. We're going to get cutaways of billboards showing women being ex exploited, and then we're going to have a voiceover where you explain about exploitation." And I said, "No." So he was gone, and then we were kind of high and dry. Uh, we just pieced things together, you know, little by little, actually a day here, a day here, over the course of, I don't know, maybe a, six months or a year, it's hard to remember. Uh, but it was the editing that really took a long time, because I kept running out of money, and the, they'd take the flatbed away. Fun fact, yes. that I just shared with uh, Heather the other day, they, um... I was renting a flatbed from Peter McCarthy, who was the producer of Repo Man, if you know that movie. Classic. Yeah. And he was coming down to the 
studio to like dun me for money and uh, and then he said, hey, this would make a great repo yard. So actually, basically, my front yard is the repo yard in Repo Man. <laughs> <laughs> See how much punk rock's on this stage, man. I just want you to know. It's just so great. And this is a question for everybody. Um, how much was this scripted, and how much was this ad-libbed, and sort of how did you go through that process, you, that Robert Altman process of, you, like... You, you, go, you guys want to talk about that? I can talk about that. The first part was storyboarded, actually. The, uh, but what I did, and what I should have explained to Liz the other day, was that I... And Tigger actually reminded me how we did it. We set up situations after the first part. But even, in the, even like when Mantra gets upset and she walks off stage, we created a habitat that people would behave within. And I would try and introduce elements that were, would probably be volatile. So, like in that fight scene in the... In the the strip strip show. Yeah, so that was not scripted in any way. But I told Tigger, I knew that the bouncer didn't want Tigger going up and no one was allowed to talk to people. You know, she her job was to keep people away from the stage. Was this Mitchell, Mitchell Brothers? That was the Market Street Cinema. Oh, hardcore. Where, yeah. That's where you went. <laughs> Mitchell, that's where you went after Mitchell Brothers. And Susie Bright was working there. Oh, yeah. Well, lots of my friends, you know, and part of my youth. It, like, everything was together. Yeah. And I think um, we didn't know it, but um, I think Sharon definitely has been part of it slow civil rights movement for sex workers to speak for themselves. I think you were like the original advocate. They weren't having safe sex in uh, porn movies. Uh, you know, when the virus came out, so she got involved in that as a spokesperson. And, and that's important shit. A little bit more than a spokesperson. I, I uh -huh. started a clinic that was, you know, uh, did 3,000 tests a month and pretty much eradicated the HIV virus from the adult entertainment industry called AIM Healthcare. So for, uh, so for both of you, um, what if, so, you set, you, so you set up a, uh, a sort of an ecosystem where people are going to react in. Right. Was any, exactly. But none of that was scripted. This was all sort of like ad-libbed or were there... No, there were scripted points. I mean, there were scripted points. But actually, uh, for you, you were the only person that had an actual script because you got yeah. off the plane and you said, what, there's no script? So I sat down and I wrote out some dialogue for you based on what you had already said. So you were reading your own lines, in a sense. Uh, same with Jerry Abrams, like the guy when he's driving around in the car. That's based on my own trip in a car with him. And he said, I said, just do that same rap you did when we went around in the car. And he said, I don't remember. And so I wrote some key lines, and you'll see him glancing down to look at his basically a cue card that I gave him about himself. Um, well, I think it adds to the, the style of the film because it's like it feels like documentary and then it feels like narrative and some stuff feels very natural but then some stuff feels like artifice, which, yeah. is, which is, creates this interesting yeah. tone. Question, you know. question. Well, question, question. Another question? Yes, my friend. You may ask all the questions. I allow it. Okay, well, I guess there's a point in the party where the porn and the fake porn in the movie are discussing amongst themselves, like women's rights versus men's rights. And I guess while I was watching that, I was wondering how, um, and if, like, the actors in this movie were compensated and how you, you went about that. If I kind of don't remember. I, um, we didn't have a lot of money. So yeah. for the most part, I think, you know, people may have gotten a little bit of money and then a percentage of money that never happened. Uh, <laughs> Did you got some remember, money? You got two hundred. What? I don't remember getting that much money. Maybe a little bit expenses and stuff. Yeah, we, I mean, we tried to share. Not really. I, and then also, I had this. The documentary part of me was like, well, you can't pay people for being a documentary. That wouldn't be legitimate. So I don't know. There was a little money. 
There wasn't a lot. <laughs> now that we have this relationship with Kino Lorber, though, I'm sure it's going to be rolling in. Sacks of money. It's going to be sacks of money. It's going to be like Miracle of 42nd Street, but it's like just money in there for this. For this. So uh, you made this film. Where did it show out in the world? Because the landscape of theaters were much different than the landscape of theaters today. We had a better run in Europe than we did here. Here it was pretty limited, and <laughs> but to what? But to what? I'm very curious. To what? Like what? what theaters? What type of theaters? Yeah, or what? Roxy, the Roxy oh. in uh, what? what San in San Francisco, and the, what was the? Did one you play in? the Waverly in New York? Maybe, mm -hmm. and uh, I think Bam even back then. Maybe the um, ancient Bam. Yeah, uh, you know, here and there the Brattle. Uh, um, in Boston, yeah? Yeah, mm -hmm. but, you know, we didn't get proper distribution here. We only got proper distribution in Europe. I mean... Did you four-wall it? Did you just bring the print around in uh, North America? No, no. I made deals in Europe with two different distributors, and... I, oh, maybe so. Maybe they, I would make a deal um, on a theater-by-theater -theater basis. It's hard to remember. There, and then what, it had a lot of, it ran, you know, uh, gay and lesbian film festivals. Yeah, a, I remember us been, winning a, a few um, awards. I think Texas Film Festival, something like that. Yeah, Italy. You were big in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> what was the response? Because it's very interesting. So nowadays it's very hip, of course, like to align yourself with the sex work or the cause of what's going on. Of course, still, it's a tradition within counterculture world to have a lot of sex worker friends and sort of be very open to that lifestyle. But back in the day, the idea that this is like, no one's no one's being exploited, no one's being abused, everyone's having fun. I feel that that's sort of like an iconic moment which you didn't see back in the day that you were, you were creating. So it feels very comfortable for us to watch it now in 2022. But I think back in the day, it, all, it almost seems... Not it's, comfortable. Yes, yeah. yes, because you're saying, like, this is what we want to do. Everybody this is our was job. angry about it. No, yeah. yeah. That's good. I mean, Tell us about the anger. Well, <laughs> um, the angriest people were probably the mainstream lesbians who didn't yeah. want a lesbian relationship portrayed in this way. And then yeah. also, you know, Tigger had been drummed out of the San Francisco seen because yeah. in the words of Susie Bright, Tigger Minette's sucking cock, you know, so she was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, there was, it was not, it was not comfortable. I wasn't, I, and then people didn't realize that it wasn't a documentary, so it didn't have a, that was another problem with the distribution because documentaries, festivals would want to put it in the documentary lineup. And I would say, but it's not a documentary, it's a, it's a feature. And they would say, no, nope, it's a documentary. So uh, that limited its distribution too, because documentaries didn't get distributed back then. Mitch, what was the reaction when Kamikaze Hearts came out for you? I, um, she probably didn't even know it came out. <laughs> I, no, I, I mean, I knew, it, I knew it came out, and I was, I was keeping an eye on it, but I, I think I was, I was uh, traveling a lot. I was doing a lot of films in Europe at the time, and I knew that it was very popular in Europe. Um, I didn't realize that there was that much controversy about it. Um, I was glad that it finally came to fruition and came out, because it took quite a while for the editing and, and the whole process to take place. Quite a while. And yeah, and I was, yeah, I was very proud, you know, any project I've ever done is very proud. Um, this one was a little different, however, you know, this one was me. This one was me shooting dope in front of the camera. This was, um, it was different, mm -hmm. definitely different for me. But I, I've never done anything I've been ashamed of on film. Or I would have changed my name a long time ago when I got my doctorate. And my doctorate says Sharon Mitchell, so I never changed my name. Again, apologetic punk rock. So uh, we're, uh, we're wrapping up this awesome uh, Q&A soon, so I'm going to go out to the crowd to see if there's any other questions for these folks on stage. Any questions? People are just too shy because she's too uh, intense. What's Tigger up to right now? Oh! I talked to her on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> she has reinvented herself. <laughs>
completely. She's living, she neither embraces nor abhors her former life, and uh, she's living in an undisclosed location <laughs> under another name. That is all true. I can confirm that because we tried to get her for the disc. <laughs> all right, so I guess we're going to wrap this up. I mean, legendary Mitch, legendary Bill Dreyer, legendary. Ju I mean, this is too cool. This is too cool. We have counterculture legends on the stage. Who's with them? Who's by the disc when it comes out? Who's post on social media how fucking cool this was? I like everybody in it. This was super important. We're important to our voices in the 80s and goddamn punk rockers. So show some respect, goddammit. Thank you.